to the cloud. We are now recording. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the June 18th edition of the monthly local and offline collaboration meetup. My name is Dietrich, and I am your very brief MC and host today as we listen to Mr. Jim Kosum, who will present to us the uh, final output of his last couple of months' work on uh, IPFS PP mobile design guidelines. Uh, please welcome Jim. Hello, all. Hey. Um, right, yeah, so uh, if those of you are there here last time, there or here, here last time, uh, the, the project for the IPFS mobile design was split into two parts. Uh, the, the last time I presented was about the research, uh, which was um, which is all in the gitbook as well. That was just presented last time, and I'll go over a quick recap of that. And, and then I'll be largely presenting the design, uh, which is the actual guidelines. So the IPFS mobile design guidelines, which are all up in gitbook and all in the repo as well. So um, I'll just let me share my screen here. Um, one second. Oh, there's the big green button. Um, uh, there we are. Can everybody see that all right? Yeah, you, you see a gift book thing that says findings up at the top? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Great. okay. Um, yeah, so yeah, just to quickly recap what, what, what you find out in the, the first half of the project, which was about the research and um, just to it's kind of, so we split it up at the findings and of course you're at your leisure, you're, you're, there's tons of interviews to look through, different sorts of findings. There's the application survey to look through where we look through different peer-to-peer -peer apps, different um, applications and browsers, uh, different OS kind of uh, patterns, um, yeah, survey of the various interaction patterns. Um, yeah, there's, there's quite a bit to go through there, um, but the quick version of it is, is this right here. And it's kind of blocked into, you could say these three rough um, categories, which is uh, around cloud services, um, P2P usability and awareness of it, and security and identity. Um, and kind of real roughly or quickly, um, some of the things we found out uh, is the, uh, cloud services are pervasive and have done a ton of work uh, in, in terms of, and by no stretch we should be throwing any of that away. Whilst uh, P2P and IPFS in particular is, is kind of, I guess, you know, moving forward, taking that a bit forward, or moving that a bit to the side of what people are used to, I think we have to kind of understand what people are used to and kind of build on these conventions. Um, there are a lot of questions about these PDP, uh, sorry, about these cloud services as well too. So uh, people we've talked with, we've spoke with, I believe 21 or 22 people, um, and they were broken up into uh, experts, which are people actively developing or working with uh, IPFS. Um, then early adopters, people you know who are just uh, either involved in anything from uh, medical data and privacy to to kind of blockchain related things to uh, just mobile usability uh, designers, um, and then the third group, which was uh, potential users, which ranged from uh, between Europe and Africa uh, for for the particular cohorts that we studied. Um, but the the question is, a lot of people had questions about these cloud services on which we are so dependent. So, um, some people weren't quite sure about them, but the, you know, they use them regardless because they've become kind of intertwined within the fabric of our lives. Uh, but there's, uh, the thing is, is that file management is a big thing of it, you know, and this includes access to what, and, and this, uh, again, brings up this issue of privacy. So there's kind of this always underlying thread about privacy. This is why people are having questions about cloud services. Um, and then the usability seems from our sample to be as important as security, but, you know, again, they're always intertwined, but it's about finding this balance and kind of treading that thin line um, between the two. Um, and one thing that came, came out as well that's quite interesting from the research is that users don't want to necessarily know what is making things work. So it's this idea about trust about, especially on the mobile device, there seemed to be this, you know, um, a lot of context switching, a lot of this kind of pervasive partial attention issues so that they don't want to know what's making it work just that it does. That's particularly important um, in mobile, it seems. Um, and PDP as a concept uh, is 
quite easily understood by everybody we talk to. Again, the sample size, this is 21 to 22 people. Uh, but again, that's going from, uh, you know, an expert active, well, they would obviously know what it is, but to the um, early adopters, they were all familiar with the concepts behind this and as well as people in emerging markets and elsewhere that would be potentially interested in this. Um, and then the other thing that came out is about the kind of mobile life, you could say it itself, which was about notifications, how notifications are kind of their function, their pervasiveness, their over pervasiveness is quite an issue as well. And again, about the phone itself and what separates it from the desktop and what separates it from uh, uh, these other experiences that we kind of researched before, in particular with the browser, is, this, is what you could call the infrastructure of mobile life, which is this idea of battery and its role and signal. And, you know, these two things, nothing can work without it. You know, these are the pipes that keep it all going. Um, and, uh, and mainly security is hard. <laughs> um, it's really hard. A lot, of, a lot of times people, despite their best intentions, uh, they they just can't be bothered a lot of times and even a lot of the early adopters we spoke with they had similar um sort of uh opinions as well um and kind of what privacy and security means is very nuanced again as well so and it's a context dependent so again what you place what value you place on your online life or what kind of data you have online also depends on kind of how you value privacy and kind of what you what you want to secure and how much and again, uh, in, in regards to the theme of this, of this meetup is, is the role of offline, you know, things working offline. Uh, a lot of people we spoke with um, obviously wished for that, but then kind of couldn't really perceive how they would use it necessarily, but were very into it. Um, so it's kind of looking at how we can make that fit into these sorts of things and kind of like nicely slide IPFS into these sorts of mobile behaviors. So again, um, looking at the offline, kind of making this, uh, I guess, dependable is part of it. And, and then looking at security and all these other sort of things. So moving on uh, into the actual design and kind of the part of it was around the design strategy. So the, the strategy itself was we started with, with these kind of key questions to frame uh, where to get started with the design. And these questions are outlined here and you know, and they're largely about how can design begin to answer these questions. So we took these and looked at kind of how we could arrange the, the design. And that was looking at, well, into prince, dividing it into principles and building scenarios based on those principles. So what we wanted, what we've done is to kind of build the overall rationale from build based on the research. And then from that, then moving on to examples and illustrations of that, that designers and developers and builders of on IPFS for mobile can kind of use the examples and kind of carry things forward. And it's all about, you know, taking this research and translating it to conceivable and usable things um, and building these interaction and interface design frameworks, which will be illustrated within the scenarios and the principles. And it's all about this mobile design guidelines being this living guide and it's in making it a reality for everybody. So again, to kind of um, being the living document and to kind of develop and enhance this practice. Um, and this is essentially design for design. Um, and it, it, because we can't necessarily rely on component libraries to describe it, we've had to, again, build these principles and then with on, on top of those principles, build out those scenarios. Um, and uh, go from that overall thinking with the principles to the scenarios, which are examples of how to think through and design for particular issues, which we'll get into in a minute. Um, the first thing we did uh, is we had a workshop with uh, active IPFS developers, um, so internal and external to protocol labs. And uh, we went through the process of taking those research findings and taking those key questions that were outlined in, in the design strategy and prioritizing them. But the, the, and you can kind of see here and you can read about the key takeaways there. But what it was is about what we wanted to do through the workshop is link uh, these questions and to users. So that because we want to make this a user centered exercise. Um, we uh, looked at who is the user and linking the problems to them. And you can see a bit of that here um, and prioritizing that and then building out their needs, building out some user personas and ranking them 
And then finally, um, linking those users to problems. So again, keeping the users a focus and then bringing up those different problems and questions and attaching to them. And then finally, um, kind of building out, or you could say were proto user stories to, to help frame the design. Uh, so it's as a, there's a role, there's the person that would be using uh, some sort of IPFS mobile application, and then what they're, they're, what they need. And then finally, after that, some, uh, sorry, um, as a, so that, sorry, <laughs> the, the thing they want to accomplish, and then the reason for that. So, um, and kind of what, th some things that can come up, and we can kind of just to, uh, really briefly is this understanding in privacy and security, which again came up and kind of attaching that and how to make that kind of evident in people's interactions with the applications. And uh, simplicity came up a number of times, making things simple, not making it complicated, which was obviously uh, paramount for something like this, because if you're introducing a new technology and potential new methods of doing things, that's absolutely important, especially on mobile where the attention is obviously uh, drastically reduced and it's also more frequent too. So people's in and out is more frequent and shorter. So, um, and then this idea about visibility and discovery and contacts because it, uh, a mobile device is after all, uh, well, it's supposed to be at any rate, uh, a communication device. So it's this idea about the files and the people attached to them and the privacy and your communications between these people. Um, any questions so far? Anybody? Should. Okay. Um, so yeah, the first thing, uh, the first half of the, the phase, first major half of it is, of course, these principles. And we broke it down into five. Um, uh, there's also five scenarios as well. So the first is uh, respect the device. Um, the second is explain, don't overwhelm. I'll go in, the, in, a, in depth in a minute. Uh, make privacy work for the user. Um, give control over data and be seamless. Um, and these are, again, uh, sort of providing this, this overall, kind of this overarching thinking, uh, this rationale to the design and how to think about the design and taking that research and starting to translate it into real world applications. So the first is uh, respect the device. Come on, there we go. Um, and each of these principles outlines kind of uh, taking bits, kind of particular bits from different parts of the research and outlining it and then developing patterns around that. So uh, and for, for instance, with respect to device, it's all about kind of learning about the nuances of smartphones and working with the reality of people's lives on them. So again, this is mobile life is a lot different from desktop life. So learning about these kind of differences, so whether they be subtle or drastic. And understanding the specific conditions and working with them for unique solutions. So. Um, for instance, uh, in, in the different patterns, one is uh, notify the user something might not finish because of the battery level. So um, each of these patterns has a do and a don't. Uh, so these are kind of helpful guides, or, um, kind of things to, to pay attention to for designers and developers um, that could, should be able to make their, their lives a bit easier when they're developing and designing new applications on APFS for mobile. Um, so for instance, and all of them, uh, many of them have illustrations. So for instance, battery, like that came up before about the, this idea about the in infrastructure of the phone or mobile life itself. Uh, you know, this thing about battery, you know, if you're trying, you're trying to get a lot of data, this drains batteries really quick. We had discussion with community members about kind of this like, throttling and how to do that. And there's different techniques and it's, it's quite an ongoing uh, piece of work, it seems. Um, but um, some of those, this can be addressed in design as well, too. So alerting users, they shouldn't get into something they might not be able to finish, for instance. Um, and again, that's likewise, you know, showing that file sharing, it, things might not take a long time, <clears throat> or it might not work a lot if there's signal and indicating that you're offline or indicating that you're online and kind of this, you know, kind of fine line between display, because again, the display is very limited. And, and thinking about uh, time and costs, you know, so in particular in emerging markets, uh, data costs are quite a big issue. In some they're not, but uh, the, the, the idea is like, what is like time and cost with these sources? Um, and uh, the next one is, the next principle is uh, explain, don't overwhelm. And a lot of that is about just being supportive. Again, that when you're trying to introduce a new way of work or a slightly new way of working or a new technology people might not be used to, then it's kind of about being supporting. And a lot of that 
is before you move on to the next one. Sorry. Yeah, well, I just wanted to make a note on the respect the device. Yeah, sure. Uh, th th I feel like this was this was one of the most challenging bits when we were doing yeah. the synthesis because we had these sometimes conflicting reports where you have like uh, maybe a user in the research who says, "No, bat battery is battery is not important to me," but it's because they carry around two battery pa battery packs. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, and, and, or like or no, three I'm, phones. I'm, I'm yeah. Not, yeah, yeah. I'm not worried about bandwidth. I carry yeah. around three battery packs, four SIM cards, and, and yeah. three phones, right? And yeah. so you, part of this in the research is it's, it's really difficult to tease those bits out, right? So this Definitely. combination of, of re, like the words from the people you interviewed mouths, mm -hmm. but then also understanding those words in, in context and, and marrying those two to be able to understand what these, what these learnings were to be able to provide guidance for the next 10,000 P2P based application builders, right? So mm -hmm. I, I thought the respect the device one was, was probably one of the most challenging in terms of understanding what the yeah, guidance that you can give to people are. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, definitely a good point. It was trying, yeah, because it, it's, it, with, with phones especially, it's interesting that from talking to some, like such a broad range of users that people just sort of put up with a lot and <laughs> they shouldn't have to. Uh, so design should address like all of that stuff that people are just kind of putting up with, you know, two different phones, four different SIMs, three different battery packs. It, it shouldn't be like that, <laughs> I guess, but people put up with a lot more. So um, yeah, that was definitely, uh, yeah, that's uh, exactly like Dietrich said, is really hard to kind of tease out. Um, and this one was also sort of hard to tease out, which is uh, this idea about not overwhelming the user with information. Um, and it's a, a lot of it is about kind of just being supportive or just enough supportive. So uh, about what is happening and when, and just being kind of gentle about things uh, and not overwhelming the user, but with the notifications or confirmations necessarily. Um, and, and a lot of it is about onboarding really. So we looked at a lot of different onboarding processes uh, with P2P and blockchain apps. And um, it's about focusing on the benefits and not the technology is largely what it's about. And it's how to, how to make that short and concise and how to kind of kind of put this all throughout the apps, really, you know, these nice supportive messages, things highlighting the benefits of these sorts I, of things. I think this really ties into what you brought up earlier around yeah. how users didn't know what offline meant. They're like, yeah. they're like super into the idea of offline. What does that mean though? It, it means and you don't need internet. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. Commu yeah. well, communicating what the capabilities are is something that yeah. a lot of these apps that were looked at do kind of implicitly, but not explicitly. Yeah, and I think this one's really, really important design lesson around users mm -hmm. don't understand what the value is if you don't explain it to them, to them right. a lot of times. Uh, right. Understanding what offline, offline means is really hard. It, it is. And it's yeah. harder, it's harder in D-Web than it is in the offline version of command in general. Because mm -hmm. there's so many like intermediate states. <laughs> yeah. So much more clear in normal web world. Uh, yeah, this, this is entirely true, yeah. Um, and one of the, the, the interesting concepts I think as well that kind of, uh, kind of wraps this all together is this idea about don't highlight what you're doing too much, you know, about, um, you know, about this, you know, the IPFS at the end in the about screen or that it's, it's about kind of putting this information, hiding the benefits up front, sorry, displaying the benefits up front, getting the, getting the user in nicely and quickly and confidently. And then finally kind of trickling in this sort of, this thing is, oh, it's built on this thing. This thing do, get, does, does all the stuff that makes this app so great to use. So it's about um, some of the, D, a lot of Z-Web apps and blockchain things in particular are very much about throw the technology words at you, self-sovereign, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and just overwhelming people. And that creates even m bigger barriers to entry. And that's what, one of the principles is to avoid, <laughs> I think. Um, and uh, again, privacy comes up in weird spots and in different ways and people's understanding of it, it varies drastically, but a lot of it is related to kind of their values. And it's, but fundamentally is about uh, privacy being, well, a right, you know, but it should be easy. You know, that's the thing. It has to be easy and it has to be just enough. And looking at some patterns, uh, again, it's, it's about, I think one of the most effective ones is a starter mode, you know, that you, you have the easy, you have the advanced, you know, and then kind of building on that, getting people in nicely. 
Um, and then they can, you know, as they advance, if they continue with the application, then they can kind of start poking around and adjusting stuff and doing all that later. But to, to kind of give, you know, that, that onboarding, because this is part of onboarding, is the settings, is getting that, you know, as quickly done as possible and to make it as less confusing as possible. Um, and and uh, this is part of it as well, too. So uh, about accounts. So um, uh, people, all the all people interviewed had loads of accounts. And I think the, the, the least amount of accounts somebody interviewed we talked with had, I think, was five. So if you imagine you have a minimum of five different emails and five different accounts that different services are tied to, you don't want to chuck another thing onto that without giving some sort of added value. So trying to communicate that up front and then allowing them to get into stuff without necessarily signing up for an account is terribly important. Um, and sorry, just checking the chat. <laughs> um, yeah. And and being clear about what the security methods that were involved is, is also terribly important as well, too. So this we looked at from uh, various kind of blockchain apps and kind of peer-to-peer -peer apps, um, in particular ones that use some sort of kind of chatting or community sort of stuff, um, because a lot of them relied on having kind of keys and recovery keys. And these are, I mean, 48 words is a lot to save or write down somewhere um, and kind of ways around that and kind of making this as easy. And if you're going to require somebody to write something down on a piece of paper or to save it in a text file or something, you have to communicate like w what exactly is happening because you can't assume that they're familiar with this. Um, and uh, an interesting one that kind of came up and one that we kind of included um, because it's all quite small, although this could be quite massive, is about account fallbacks. People that we spoke with um, were liked that, you know, that there was uh, with their Gmail, that it can go to another email, and then the phone number has another phone number attached to it, that there's, that there's, no, that there's a fallback, there's a fail safe, there's a way to, to get back into it. It's not just going to be all lost if I lose these words. However, um, this obviously has a lot of contrast with a lot of kind of D-Web practices, which kind of potentially give users, especially new users, perhaps potentially too much responsibility in kind of trying to um, deal with these. Um, the next one is give control over data. So again, these are kind of active suggestions. So, uh, so to give control over data. Uh, is about who can do what to what, you know, the, the file, the thing I have, the chat that I have, who, who can access it, what can they do to it, what can I do to it, you know, what, are, what is this control, you know, what, what do I have the ability to do? Uh, the first thing with that you should probably do would be to assure the files are safe, you know, if, if you have a, a file sharing application or something where you can kind of move things around, then assure the user that it just won't disappear one day. You know that, or assure that who can see it and somebody somebody else can't delete it necessarily. And again, that's clearly related to be clear about who has access to what. You know, and kind of oh that thing is locked or that thing is not. You know, these kind of quick scans that you can kind of look through. You can kind of quickly understand because again, a mobile is a, a mobile interaction is a very quick in, interaction, and it's all about kind of scanning and kind of flipping through very quite quickly. Um, and finally is classic files and folders. Uh, <laughs> there's speaking to a lot of people about different methods of file management and how they're managing access and stuff. It seems, although there's, I'm sure, tons of research saying that there's way better ways of doing stuff. Um, this is what people are used to. And we don't want to innovate too much for people, especially when you're on a phone. <laughs> so um, kind of keeping to these kind of classic paradigms that people are used to, and again, sliding it, it kind of nicely in. And if you're going to introduce new methods for managing and stuff, then to kind of do that quite gradually or quite easily and to give fallbacks into these things. So, and finally, it, it, yeah, sorry. Just a couple, a couple of notes on that one. Yeah. I feel like it, it, when we, when we were looking at this particular principle, there are a few things related to IPFS and how it relates to the host operating system that it's running on that kind of came up repeatedly. Uh, you know, we have on the on the desktop we have an IPFS repo, and it's separate from your desktop file system. You don't see the stuff in in your IPFS repo in Finder or vice versa. <clears throat> and on mobile, that so on desktop, that's that's kind of a, like there's a lot of applications that work that way. So it's mm -hmm. not as big of a deal. But on mm -hmm. mobile, you you have fewer places to look, and you know a little bit more where your stuff is. 
And so photos was one of the examples that we walked down in detail. And in photos, there's either the photos that are in your photos app that's part of the OS, and then there's the things that you have published and uploaded somewhere. So it's, it's like it, it, here, the, being really clear, like it's very clear that you first have a copy. Uh, the IndieWeb principles have this too, where you like uh, publish on so own site posse, like publish on own site first and then uh, syndicate elsewhere. Uh, and mobile kind of works that way by default, where you take a photo, and unless you're using the Instagram, the actual app to take the photo, in which case like that, that publishing aspect is really clear, the, it, it's generally unambiguous around where your data is. You know that it's in your in your photos app in, in, in this most common use case. But um, with DWeb, it's not as clear. And the sharing part becomes interesting, interestingly similar to how those systems work. So when you share something on IBFS, you know, we often catch that. And once you put that data out there, somebody else can keep posting it. Mm -hmm. And when you phrase it that way, that actually kind of just sounds like what Instagram's doing with your photo today. Mm -hmm. You put it out there and they're hosting it. Now you could delete your account and that photo would go away, but it still doesn't mean that Instagram doesn't have a copy of it or that somebody didn't take a screenshot of it. Or so it was, it was I feel like we, we came with to some guiding principles, some like high level things mm -hmm. for guidance here. But we also ended up with a lot of questions around yeah. how to communicate about IPFS, how to communicate about where your stuff is, and that some of that is still is, isn't even really fully answered in the in the core protocol. Yeah, true. Uh, and and there's still some some work to do in the core, not just around giving design guidance. Yeah. Um. And uh, further to that, uh, there seems to be an assumption as well that if I took a picture or if I recorded a thing and it, I did it with my phone, there is sort of the assumption that oh, of course it's on the phone still because this is the magic recording device, right? So there's, it's working with that as well too. And again, that's kind of sort of contrary, like Dietrich said, to kind of D-Web and kind of uh, decentralization user patterns, which is kind of it's on the network somewhere and you're just only kind of poking at it now and again. So it's just about kind of the, the, local, the local thing versus the, I guess the offline or the internet or the network store of it and kind of dealing with that, so. Um, and, and a lot of that is sort of to do with the next one, uh, which is it's, it's about being seamless and it's about kind of going between these nicely and telling the user what's going on so they, they understand what's happening. And uh, a lot of that is with uh, around managing connections. So uh, some apps require you to switch modes, let's say, or that you have to adjust things and they shouldn't have to do that. Um, and in not requiring much from the user, you know, and, and a lot of that is around settings, you know, settings are confusing, especially, you know, when you create quick ways to get people on, then it's, a, it's about removing those things and making it really easy. And part of that is about doing the hard work to, to take out as much as you can to make, you know, have as few settings as possible. So in kind of creating that kind of starter to pro level, I guess you could say, and to do it, but to kind of hide things away to, because part of this seamless experience is that is built is confidence building, so that you're educating, and it's confidence building that it'll just sort of work. You know that when I'm using this thing, built on this IPFS stuff, it'll just sort of work, and I don't have to worry about it because I don't want to take up my phone and kind of mess with yet another app. And so this is kind of the realities of mobile life, which are again quite different from the kind of context of desktop life. Yeah, yeah. One of the one of the things we we noticed when we were talking about this kind of stuff is um, this confidence building, right? So the design of libp 2 p is basically so that you don't have to worry about the type of connection you have. It's supposed to make a lot of that transparency. It just finds a way. Life finds a way over yeah. P2P, yeah. whether it's through MDNS or whether it's direct TCP connections, which are whether it's bootstrapping and then relaying over other networks. libp 2 p is designed from the ground up with a principle of just find the connection, so you don't have to worry about it. But right now, the reality of it is, is we do confidence building by doing things like showing you how many peers you have. And for a lot of users, that's, that's both a, it's a combination of too much and the wrong information. Mm -hmm. Like, like we don't, we don't in, in our, our core apps, we don't do things like say, you have 38, you have 78 peers, but none of them can be reached or you have 78 peers, but the actual, like, you know, we measure the round trip of, a, of an example request and it's super, super slow. So the confidence level should actually be really low, even though you might have a lot of peers, for example, if you're slowly collected them over an edge connection or something. Uh, and we don't think have things like uh, dynamically managed high and low watermarks. And so there's this, there's a, we're in this weird situation where we don't have a lot of good examples of how to build that confidence on top of a P2P system. Mm -hmm. um, the, 
in, in Ethereum, you come back with this, like the, the growing number of validations of a transaction, which again, I think is a very similar example where you showed that you showed the guts of how the machine works as a way to build confidence. And it kind of has the opposite of effect. So I think there's still really a, like, this is more like a prompt in the beginning of an opening of that, what that B seamless question looks like for P2P, where providing too, providing too much information is sometimes the wrong information. It yeah. has the opposite effect of confidence building. So it's, it's a really hard problem. Yeah, I mean, part of the con, yeah, it is. It's, uh, yeah, it's insane, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's massive actually. Because I mean, part of, part of the confidence is, is that you want to do it again, right? And if, if there's too much to do, then you're not gonna have confidence that this is worth doing. So it's, it's kind of, there's, you know, it's quite an amalgam of issues and problems. And it is quite context specific. Uh, and again, that context is also drastic from, you know, place to place, from kind of society to society, geography to geography. Um, from the principles, we built scenarios. And again, the, the principles are, let's say, a rationale, like a, a kind of a framing of thinking and how to think about these different things, about, you know, again, respecting the device. And when I'm doing some, when I'm just starting to build, when I'm starting to design, I should be, this should be seamless to the user and they should have the ability to do that and that and that. Um, and then from that, we built these scenarios. And uh, scenarios are user flows or sort of design patterns. But um, we chose to do this through an app X and an app Y to kind of illustrate uh, its use. So kind of taking uh, a problem or an issue or uh, basically a scenario that would be the solution to an issue and then kind of describing it through app X and apps, app, app Y, which Apps. So just to provide the description through an interface, essentially. So um, those are, um, and I'll go again in detail, um, and just poke in whenever you want, or if something's not clear, or if I'm talking too fast, for instance. Um, uh, the first one is, uh, the user onboards confidently with minimal technical knowledge. That's a lot of what we're talking about. And that's why this one's first, basically. Um, and then uh, the user shares the file through another app. Again, you know, people don't want to it shouldn't be like, no, you have to install this thing. You have to spend a ton of time on this thing. You got to kind of build up all that stuff, which is contrary to sort of kind of how the app world has worked, which is kind of about that you're fostering, that you're farming, that you're kind of loading up and kind of giving these companies all of your data to just kind of build up all of this stuff into these silos. And this is about kind of using the phone as it already is. And because it's about kind of reducing those barriers to entry because people don't need any more apps. Um, a large file is sent to a user. That sounds extremely simple, and it is, but it's, uh, it's one of the biggest issues. It's like moving around big stuff, right? And that's kind of one of the advantages that PDP has is that dealing with large files, um, especially locally and offline. Uh, the user plays a shared media file with wi without Wi-Fi or a mobile network. So this is very much about this, the theme of this talk or this meeting. Um, and one of the, the advantages that, that something built on IPFS has that Dropbox doesn't, you know, or that these things that are so pervasive that are just normal, that are part of the every day of people's online lives. And then finally, a user manages their chat identity because ultimately uh, identity is more pervasive with when you're talking about communication between two people rather than kind of moving files between two people. So we looked at an illustration of kind of look of that as well. Uh, so the first is, uh, the first scenario is that the user onboards confidently with minimal technical knowledge. Um, and just looking at that real quick. Uh, right, so kind of what we found in the research is, yeah, well, the, the onboarding is fast and passable while secretly, while you're having this kind of secretly informative process. And that makes people feel good about starting a new thing. And that's, again, talking about onboarding, onboarding, onboarding. And so one of the things that kind of kept on coming up in this confidence building, like what we're talking about. And for each of these scenarios as well, we have kind of links to the research. Uh, we have the design considerations. And those design considerations are things that designers and builders should have in mind for particular bits of interactions. And those are also within the each step of each particular interaction. And again, we want to tie this to a user. This is, we want to do user-centered design. We want to think about actual people using actual apps in actual life. And so in this particular thing, we somebody concerned about censorship and privacy and who, and they want to know where these files go. And putting that into practice is the actual user flow, the illustration of what that looks like for that particular user that they would 
they would download and install the app. And it's open for the first time. So again, they're interested in testing, but their commitment level might be sort of low at this point. So how can we get them in? And it's again, establishing that way to like, you can get started without committing too much. And especially if you're con concerned about privacy. Um, and the user chooses the basic privacy settings. So again, making that as easy as possible, but safe and communicating safe enough, but giving them the advanced thing as well so they can go into that. And then uh, perhaps most importantly is telling them what that means. So telling them what they signed up for. So if they chose basic, your privacy settings mean this, you decided blah, 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 X, Y, and Z. And then if you're not, if you're not comfortable with that, you should probably go back. <laughs> or you know, if you wanna sign up for an account, um, you can do so here, but bear in mind, you can continue without so, you know, doing so. And this particular user, um, as many users, I would say the overwhelming majority of users of apps, they decided to create the account later. And that's quite important to give the idea that they can use it, that they have functionality, that it's not just kind of barely workable without, without having an account and kind of that value add for that account, especially for people concerned about privacy. Because there's, you know, again, people have tons of accounts, they have tons of worries, they have tons of things in the back of their mind that they, they, they wanna be able to use something without committing. However, once they've started using the, all of that value, once they've started being get, the kind of the benefits from this, then they can kind of get additional values and those need to be kind of communicated up front. Um, and then uh, the second scenario is the user shares a file through another app. And again, the, who the user is, uh, is let's say a student in their early 20s. Again, these are kind of generic user personas and they want to sell they want to send files because that's what a lot of people do that's what people's understandings when you talk to them is like when we ask users and potential users and early adopters and everything like what is your understanding of p2p and they say oh that means i can get uh, a file or a data from one computer to another directly when which is exactly what it is pretty much so um and putting that into practice is about using uh, again uh, the stuff people are already doing. You don't want to create a, a, a potentially another gallery app if people are already using another. So uh, if they opened up the photo gallery, let's say, and if this was available through the share menu in, well, at least iOS and Android, which are the ones we looked at. Um, granted, there's others, uh, but these are obviously the most prevalent. Um, then, you know, this should app X is available through the share menu, just as Telegram is available in the share menu or Dropbox is available in the share menu. Thus, app X, which is built on IPFS, would also be available there. And again, the design consideration is about using stuff people are already doing. Don't make their lives more painful. <laughs> That's the number one concern when you're trying to base things around the users is don't make it worse, right? And they decide to select and share it. And then let's say if this, if AppX had context, then you know they can choose the most frequent context. And they're gonna share that picture of that really cute cat. And they're and then they're gonna show how it's being shared. So it's being add to network and send link. So that's a bit of a switch for some users. So you need to inform them. It's you're not sending necessarily, you're sending actually a link to something that has been placed on a network. So there's, again, education throughout all of the interactions and saying that it's like, oh, it's on the network. I have confidence it will be there later. And perhaps most important is out of all this is the confirmation and then kind of linking it back and then showing. There's that really long bunch of letters and numbers and all that other stuff, but that means IPFS and that means it saves someone. So it's again, that confidence building as throughout these little bits of, in, bits of interactions. That's a that's a really interesting point, and I, I'm not sure that we have a lot of design work that's been done there around, like, one, what it means when there's a an address that yeah. is an IPFS address, two, how we visually signify that, mm -hmm. and then three, how we reinforce what that actually means when you see that type of address and however we visually right. signify it. Like, it does mean a bunch of things. Yeah. And I think we, that, that's maybe some, some follow on work here, which is from mm -hmm. a visual design standpoint, how do, how do we actually develop and mature that communication, especially as browsers are, uh, we have a couple of browsers that are implementing native IPFS addresses. Uh, in the browsers I guidelines, we ask that question, how do, mm -hmm. what does it mean when you see that in the, in the address bar, as opposed to HTTP colon slash slash, what do we need to communicate both from a risks and a capabilities standpoint? 
Yeah, exactly. It's still, and, still a lot of fertile ground there. Uh, yeah, and and kind of this obviously harkens directly to the kind of you know blockchain world where you say zero x that means an address and that means magic stuff goes value. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it those, means things. <laughs> things go to that address, you know, and you see zero x and that means it's a a place somewhere or it's a wallet or it's a, it can hold value of some sort. So kind of looking at that, that when you see that, that means it, it always goes to a thing or a place somewhere. And again, but if we show these addresses, if we have visual indications, um, and maybe it's, I don't know, some sort of new iconography developed around this to say, oh, it's on the network, it is safe, you know, that these little sort of things like the padlock, let's say that's something akin to that, let's say. Um, the the third you, scenario, oh, sorry, yeah, go uh, ahead, Chair. Sorry, yeah. Jim, tell yeah. me more about why you're thinking of it as safe, because I, it to me it means like, I know that is the content I put there, if yeah. it's still there, but there's no guarantee that it's still there if everybody who happened to be nice and host it has their computer off. Right, yeah, I guess, oh, yeah, because we're going to get into this a bit in the, I think okay. in the, the, the fourth one in okay. terms of kind of pinning and publishing. And so this is just looking at, um, sorry, yeah, the, this is definitely a good point because at this point they, they would just have to be an AppX user for a while to understand the idea of safety, but that it's just gone somewhere, I guess, is what I was trying to describe to that. And then in, I think, the either the next one or the one after that, we described the idea of kind of uh, okay. taking it or it being on the network or versus on your phone in this idea of where it is and thus your confidence that it's there. Yeah, uh, I, I, think, I think that's a great question because I think that's, Terry, as, as something, safety, as, a, as a project, yeah, we haven't really articulated yet. Like yeah. safe means it can't mm -hmm. be taken down. Right, but safe, unsafe like in a normal also might be that it can't be taken like, yeah. Dropbox yeah. has my thing. Has right. it finished uploading yeah. to Dropbox? Like they definitely have it. Someone else has it. Right. It's okay if I delete it off my thing. It's still there, which is not the thing that we're talking about. So no, uh -uh. and uh, like I, I gave in the chat, I it's gave like, Beaker as an example. Beaker tells you how many other people are sharing that app right now. Yeah. So you have this kind of view of. Oh, the pop, yeah, the popularity <laughs> of it, like yeah, from, yeah. A, from a, it might disappear at any moment standpoint, and right. Oculus doesn't, as that built into the protocol, but we don't do that at the content level at all, mm -hmm. and that's something that when you read about how people talk about IPFS that don't know how it works, that's how they talk about it. They say, well, IPFS, yeah, your stuff stays up as long as it's popular, mm -hmm. but that that's not fundamentally how the dynamic works right now. It, it's not a false statement, but it's also not a true statement or any kind of guarantee. So it's still really, really undecided. Do uh, we a... have any way to know like how many people have pinned a thing or how many people are currently hosting that thing on the or network? Like, do, would we even blocks. have a way to give those numbers? What'd you say? Yeah, yeah, but like who's providing which blocks, who's providing which CADs. Mm -hmm. Like the, technically those things are things you can find out at, at the protocol level. That is not something that has percolated really up into how we build applications or how we communicate to users around that level of like the comp, what is the confidence threshold for, for yeah. something like that? How many people are simultaneously downloading this right now too? All right. There's, there's uh, actually this brings up and which could be another scenario, which is what number safe is my file, which is like how many people are pinning it, let's say, or, you know, that sort of thing that could be an entirely different thing. So. Um, oh, it's six. It's fine. And then thus, if it goes to one, am I warned that the thing that I started is only one? That means I have to pin it again or whatever. So yeah, it's... Is accessible uh, a better word than safe for that? Um, I don't know. This We'd have to probably ask some people. That's a good question. I, I think we, can, I think I think we can't jump. I think, yeah. yeah, I think we can't jump to the conclusion or the end there, yeah. especially because safe is going to be really user task dependent. So if the user is trying to take down something, then the thing being there is not safe. If the user is trying to make sure something stays up, uh, like in a censorship regime, then it, it being up is safe. So I think like safe maybe is a good word, but I like, I, I like that idea of uh, health maybe or accessibility, like, mm -hmm. although that's overloaded with, with that has a lot of different out, accessibility. Yeah. Accessibility. But that idea of like, yeah, how, how long has it been there too? Just because you have right. six nodes providing now doesn't mean they're going to be there when China blocks that port that IPFS is running on or, you know, so there's, it, it's going to be user task dependent for sure. And I think we do need a higher level of, of uh, there-ness 
accessibility, yeah, as you said. Yeah, that's we don't have it yet. <laughs> there you go. You, you invented it, thereness. Um, and kind of, I, I think it's this one, but we'll find out in a second uh, if this is the one that kind of describes that scenario a bit. Um, in looking at somebody working with huge files and potentially limited internet access. And uh, yeah, this is about, yeah, looking at the whole transfer process and where is the file and who has it and kind of what we were just talking about. And here's a potential illustration of how an AppX would handle that. And this is again, um, uh, looking at a very mobile specific context with that. And it's about notifications and kind of putting that in, somebody's sending you a file. And so you see that they have an ID or that there's somebody that's in your context, you've connected to them, let's say somehow. And uh, again, uh, showing that they can delete, they can stop stuff, they can kind of prevent things from getting in. This is about giving control about, you know, who has access to this thing, you know? If they can put, wait, they can put files into my, into my phone, how does that work? You know, so these are things that you kind of try to have to communicate. And let's say if this image is downloaded and it's a raw file, so it's, you know, 96 megs or whatever, um, and they can, you know, look at it and it looks just like any other photo app, let's say. And that isn't just because it would be easy, but it's just that we need to follow these conventions. It should look like a regular file based app, let's say. And um, one thing that I think that we didn't have time to explore would be the notion of history. So people brought up versioning and kind of a Dropbox has that kind of is a really nice feature. Well, if you pay for it, I guess, to get the business one, I think you have more versions or something. Um, so that would be something to look at as well. Um, again, uh, it's potentially more complicated, too complicated for this particular scenario. But um, if the user was to delete an app, they kind of they have to understand where it is first, right? So if you give the user in AppX the ability to to sync with the phone storage, which is let's say they can set that as default, or or maybe they set it as not as default, or keep an AppX meaning IPFS only, then they can kind of choose between those. And if it's synced between, and if it's synced with the phone storage, then they say, well, I can delete it from app X, but it's still on my phone. And this kind of goes back to the thing you brought up before about Instagram. So that I delete it from there, but it's actually on their server somewhere, but how, communicating these sort of things that this actually works a lot different and it's probably a, potentially a lot safer and better for you. Um, and it's about giving those preferences and kind of simplifying these as much as humanly possible. And of course, giving them the ability to download it. <laughs> and you know, d delete it. That's part of the safety issues as well too, is, is trying to control as much as you can within the realms of how IPFS works. And yeah, in this case, the user deletes it and it's gone. And that seems like a normal operation to them. Of course, that's because they, oh, it's on my phone still, but it's disappeared from the network. So it's kind of working with these and trying to explain how it works while trying to make it look like something they're already used to. Um, and the, the next one, the second last one, in the interest of time, I'll maybe kind of hurry up, basically. <laughs> um, so uh, the user plays a shared media file without Wi-Fi, and this is exact, completely offline in trying to say what offline is. This person in this scenario is they're on a train. So um, it, at least in many, the UK in particular, train reception when you're on the train is pretty quite spotty, if at all. So it's like, I'm with some other somebody else, how do I get the file to them? Or like if you're in a plane, same sort of thing. And it's about when in notifying them that they're offline, Bluetooth is the thing that's working for you right now. The other stuff is not, Wi-Fi is gone, no signal, et cetera, because your phone's telling you that. So but this is gonna say it's offline, but it's still to work. It still will work and it's communicating that. And they wanna preview the file and there's, um, you know, the. It was Rick Astley, I can forget the guy's name. <laughs> um, and so again, that you see the, the kind of address you, oh, that looks like that code, that means it's gone somewhere and it's been published, meaning, so this is looking at this idea of kind of pinning and what does that mean and what can we kind of, we work around the meanings of these things and what will apps change their own words for these potentially, because who knows, um, but looking at kind of what, what makes sense to users to get them started quickly. And they use, yeah, QR code. Okay, I got my phone, you got your phone. And wow, the file magically goes there. And QR codes are, I mean, sort of obscure, but also completely like gaining traction with a lot of different things because they're used for confirmations a lot of times. And they're used in increasingly more and more in some places like China and um, uh, yeah, the, 
the Far East or whatever you want to call Eastern Asia, um, is yeah, this we use quite uh, quite a lot. And so it's about you know putting in the profile, what's the information, here's the thing, and it can be all done without the internet or the internet as people think about it. Um, and about unpublishing, well, I want to take this thing down. So I unpublish that and I can control that right from that file. So it's about who has control, who can access what from where. And it's about this, you know, the safety or whatever you want to call it. And, you know, there's probably a lot of work trying to come up with the right words for what that means and giving those people the controls right there. And finally, uh, the last scenario is a user manages their chat identity. And there seems to be like when we looked at all the apps in kind of in the peer-to-peer -peer realm that we found that were released or active for mobile that they, they kind of were quite, quite distinctly divided between files, meaning largely torrents, and then kind of some sort of chat or community sort of features, i.e. Uh, Miniverse, Scuttlebutt, that, those sort of things. But kind of what we looked at is, is this messaging scenario, which is about getting started and discovering. And one of the hard things about this, uh, the peer-to-peer -peer world is uh, discoverability in allowing yourself to be discoverable. And a lot of these don't, uh, many of the things we looked at kind of that you have to send a direct link a different way. You can't put yourself, make yourself discoverable. Not that I found it at any rate. Um, in the in the survey and putting that into practice means that if I'm getting started on an app I can I can look at my profile to make sure I'm discoverable so I can put myself I understand that I've looked at my profile to make sure I'm aware of what I'm about to do let's say and I have some sort of recovery and trying to communicate that and there's a lot of text there on the recovery bit <laughs> but um, it's that balance and that would take a lot of work trying to make that as simple as possible as well too, that these magic 12 words, you need them, are in, and what can you do about that? Um, and again, that they search for somebody who have made themselves discoverable. And it's about kind of creating these layers on top of the network to kind of add, well, basically stuff we're used to in our regular life. If I type, um, I don't know, Dietrich into Telegram, you know, he'll show up, I guess. I don't remember. It was a while ago. <laughs> but, or somebody else. That This idea of discoverability leads to building the network of users. And it's something that needs to be taken quite, well, quite seriously. And the, and it, but this also highly illustrates this notion of this, this really fine line between security and usability. And kind of how do we mix and match those? Or how do we go one way or the other or allow the user to go one way or the other? And so, so to wrap up, and there they found the other user. Um, I'll be quick because we're probably over time. <laughs> it's it's a, a lot of this work is about uh, playing to conventions, but improving on them. So again, we don't want to reinvent the wheel with this. You know, there's no need for that because Dropbox and Google Drive and all these things have done tons of usability work and trying to understand how people understand about files being moved around and what chat means and all these other sorts of things and notifications are everywhere, um, but they require, I believe, a lot of testing to, to, to get to that fine balance of what is enough and what is too much. You know, do you want to confirm every single thing? Probably not. And do you want to set controls to confirm every single little thing? Probably not. So how do you get to that kind of like that really nice mix? Um, and user education that pops up everywhere. It's about the confidence building. It's about the kind of saying that, the, you know, it's, it's about sliding IPFS nicely into mobile life. That it's, yeah, it's, it works. Here's the benefits. I use this thing. It's, you know, about showing the links about maybe a subtle logo and about kind of about that. What is the equivalent to the padlock? You know, what is, what is the, the analog to that? And telling the user what's going on, you know, and doing it quickly and not confusing them and not overburdening them with things. And again, um, explaining what's happening with pinning or publishing or whatever you want to call it. And, and yeah, I, like I said before, but I probably can't say enough, is, is this fine line between security and usability. Um, because usability on a phone is kind of a do or die operation. Uh, it's, you, if, if it's not usable, people will delete it quicker than they will anything else. So how, how to make that happen? And through hopefully these principles and scenarios, designers, developers for IPFS will be able to make that happen. Or in this will, you know, their work will feed back into this and likewise it'll grow in all of these efforts really. So, sorry, that was long-winded. Um, but <laughs> if there's any questions, uh, yeah, shoot away.
Thank, thanks a lot, Jim. There's, there's really a lot of- uh, There's a ton there's a, sorry. There's a, there's a lot of material in this. Yeah. Uh, there's a, uh, so if we're almost out of time, if folks have yeah. more questions, uh, feel free to uh, ask. Uh, I think I linked the, in the previous blog post, Jim's on Twitter. Uh, and use Telegram. <laughs> I don't or, yeah, we have, the, we have the Telegram yeah. um, group that was linked at the bottom of the last blog post. And then this, these findings will be shared in a blog post coming up on the yep. NFS blog as well. So yeah, that's, that kind of summarizes everything. And yeah, that, that's, so, that's it really. So yeah, let me know, um, or Dietrich or whoever. And yeah, well, let's, I guess, make some apps or something. I don't know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for your patience. Uh, and yeah, yeah, there was a lot to get through. So uh, no, that was great. Thanks for sharing. Thanks Thank for you. doing this work. All right. No thanks, worries. everybody, for joining. See you Thank in you. a month. Okay. Uh, I'll put the topic and agenda. I think we already have a, a speaker lined up for next time who uh, I think Evan here might be one of the speakers. So we will talk to you all in a month. I'll update the issue with that information ASAP. Okay, great. Thanks, everyone. Yeah. Bye. Thank you.